I love commencement ceremonies. The parade of faculty dressed in colorful academic regalia, the students, those who march solemnly, those who strut, and those who wear Ronald McDonald shoes in Muhlenberg colors. <laughs> I cry at every graduation whether I know anyone or not. So thank you. Thank you to the Muhlenberg trustees, to the faculty, and to the graduates for the opportunity to share this day with you. And thank you to my husband of 39 years, Llewellyn Miller, for traveling with me and likely being the only person in the audience who will remember what I said one week from now. <laughs> Economist Myra Strober says, the biggest career decision that you will ever make is your choice of life partner. I clearly got this one right. I like to think that this honorary degree is a recognition of a good life and that I have been invited to share with you my secret recipe. Before I do so, though, it's important to acknowledge the role of luck. As a black woman, I was fortunate to be born to college-educated parents in 1955, a year, before, a year after Brown versus Board of Education, and to finish high school in 1972, a year after the passage of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, and to enter the workforce at a time when society's interest in racial and gender equity arguably peaked. But it wasn't all luck. Today, I will share a few of my ingredients for living a good life. One, if you get to be in the room where it happens, you need to make something happen. Use your privilege. And you will all be, have a privilege as you march out of here as college graduates. Use that privilege to make the world better. My parents constantly reinforced a responsibility to use our advantages to advance our community, to advance our race, and to make the world better. Here's one example. Election Day 1964, LBJ versus Goldwater. I was nine years old. The Voting Rights Act would not be passed until 1965, but the courts had already struck down some of the obstacles created to prevent black people from voting. Even so, the election officials at our polls made a unilateral decision, and I'll note none of them were from our neighborhood, to lock the doors of our local polling place at 7 p.m. with more than 100 people who had waited in hours for hours still in line. My mother, incensed, argued with the election officials, then jumped in her car to go get an election lawyer, leaving nine-year-old me behind to make sure that no one left the line. I don't know why people listened to a pint-sized nine-year-old, but they did. By seven, she was back with the election lawyer, and everyone in line was allowed to vote. If you doubt that restrictions on the location and number of polling places, burdensome identification requirements, and intimidation impact a people's ability to exercise their right to vote, observe that before 1964, the black voting percentage in this country was 20%. And in 1964, it climbed to 58.5%. Two, second. Don't waste your emotional bandwidth on hate. Emmett, my dad, was the first African American to win a citywide election in Dallas when he won a runoff for the Dallas School Board in 1967. On the day that he was sworn in, a woman, I will call her Miss Dixie, sat on the front row dressed in full Klan regalia. From that seat, she glared at my dad nearly every school board meeting for the next six to seven years. I never heard him speak a negative word against her. 
About midway through his term, she stopped wearing the full regalia. And 10 years later, when my dad retired from the board, Miss Dixie approached him and said, Dr. Conrad, I've been watching you. And sometimes I think that you were the only one who really cared about the children. My dad recognized that most stories about the Ku Klux Klan members do not end this way. And so do I. But he recognized that hating her would take up valuable bandwidth that could be better directed to creating a free breakfast program, ending a mandate that pregnant teens drop out of school, and creating bilingual education program, and desegregating sports and extracurricular activities like speech and debate. My third ingredient, you will realize your greatest potential by elevating and amplifying others. When I was bored with diagramming sentences in high school, most of you probably have never diagrammed a sentence, my teacher gave me a new assignment. One of my classmates, Kevin, had managed to get to 10th grade without fully learning to read. My job was to tutor him during class time, since neither of us was getting much out of diagramming sentences. One year later, when our high school formed its first speech and debate team, I joined the debate team. And at the tournament, I sat in on the extemporaneous speech competition. Extemporaneous speech is where you are given a news article to read and then must give a short speech based on it. Guess who represented our school at extemporaneous speaking? Kevin. My debate team won but nothing, nothing compared to the exhilaration of watching Kevin give that speech when one year before he was struggling to read. Many of your professors will tell you the same thing. It feels good to have that paper or book published. It feels even better to see your student's name in print. The best teachers, the best managers, the best leaders recognize that your success is defined by the success of those you teach, those you manage, those you lead. And the best employees make their bosses look good. At the MacArthur Fellows Program, we identify exceptionally creative individuals who have shown promise for more to come and give them the visibility and financial freedom that allows them to take more risks. At Lever for Change, we identify, amplify, and elevate bold problem solvers and connect them to equally bold funders. In four years, we have unlocked 1.5 billion in philanthropic grants for social change. In both programs, we seek the creative thinkers who might otherwise remain undiscovered because of discrimination, poverty, and other systemic inequality. And because of this work, I can take a teeny bit of credit for an Emmy, a Grammy, and an Oscar and a Tony. What's that, the EGOT? A Pulitzer and a Nobel Prize. I can take credit for functional zero homelessness in 10 US cities, improved diagnosis of mental illness in 12 Texas healthcare systems, the first global coalition of refugee-led organizations to advocate on their own behalf, and Body the Goat, a new Muppet who appears in an Arabic language sesame program called Ahilam Sinsen. So that's it. That's my secret recipe for a good life. Use your privilege and your luck to make things happen. Don't waste your emotional bandwidth on hate and realize your greatest potential by elevating others. Thank you for this acknowledgement and congratulations to the graduates and their families.